Grace, mercy, and peace belong to you. They are free gifts from the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. A new list came out the other day. I don't know whether you saw it. Ranking the best known brand names in the world. Apple topped the chart as the most recognizable brand name. Coke, which used to vie with Apple for the top logo spot, dropped a third to be replaced by, you guessed it, the ubiquitous Google. I wonder where God ranked on that list of brand names. Poor guy probably didn't even rate an honorable mention. God so often is blamed and feared rather than admired and loved. After all, what do you expect when you take the rap for everything from sending punishing tornadoes and wildfires to broken economies and political systems to allowing endless wars, all of, cause, all of course because of sexual permissiveness, but not to mention being the cause of rampant unemployment and every disease known to man. God just can't catch a break. It seems he's either a punishing judge, a temperamental tyrant, or a bored, distant deity who sometimes plays favorites but is unconcerned with human pain and suffering. Not a whole lot to like. God, it seems, could use some rebranding. A new image, if you will. Or maybe, tell me what you think. I haven't officially closed down my old public relations company. So I'm thinking maybe God could use a little help. I even have a new tagline to make God seem even more lovable and to buy the big guy some market share. Want to hear it? Yeah, I see one or two nods, so I guess I'll take that as a yes. So you can be my first focus group. Try this on for size. God, a safe place to be. Pretty powerful stuff, don't you think? All we need is to maybe snag Paul McCartney or maybe better yet, Justin Bieber to create the jingle. And we need to get James Earl Jones to do the voiceover. And bam! I think we got a winner on our hands. Gotta be back on top of the charts before you know it. I can sense the excitement just building. <laughs> Try to control yourselves. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I have to confess that I've appropriated that line, God, a safe place to be, from the message translation of Psalm 62, one of the weekly companion texts to this morning's readings. The image of God as a safe place to be suggests that no matter what is happening, God is always a safe harbor, a refuge in the midst of the storms and chaos of life. From Lamentations, which Jenny read, we hear the prophet Jeremiah wrestle over the near destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. But hope, like Phoenix, rises amid the ruins. And from Luke and his version of the very familiar image of the mustard plant, we experience more seeds of a future, a future amid the wreck of life. That is, if we place our faith, which really means our trust, in the one who makes a new way out of no way. Isn't that the God we all really yearn for? Kind of like the classic definition of home. 
for they have to take you in no matter what. What if God is always just there waiting? When Jeremiah weeps in lamentations over the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, we can almost see in our mind's eye of today the burned out streets of Detroit, the neglected neighborhoods of East St. Louis, or farther away maybe the bombed out city of Damascus, maybe the riotous streets of Cairo. Perhaps we can even weep, weep over the destructive and divisive state of our country today. Well, back in the day, leaders of Israel and Judah mindlessly fell under the spell of multiple gods and pushed aside the poor. Those of us in the 21st century seem no less blind in our insistence that our political and religious points of view are all that matters, regardless of what the other fellow thinks or suffers. When times change with such sudden negative impact, back then as today, it always raises the inevitable question of where is God when pain and suffering rear their ugly heads. The title of a popular book some of you may remember from the 1970s, Where is God when bad things happen to good people? Which is another way of asking, why me? Am I being punished? And if so, for what? It's not fair. If God is all-powerful and all-knowing, why in heaven's name can't he stop all this bad stuff? Or is it that he just doesn't care? All of these are topics worthy of greater explanation, but for now I just want to offer one observation, which I hope will lead us into the larger message from Luke, which is namely that it only takes a little bit of faith to move a great God toward the larger good. But the key to even that wisdom lies in getting your heart and mind around the nature of good and evil. So maybe try to look at it this way. We are blessed and gifted with human freedom, provided by God. But we live in a world where suffering is an inevitable part of the fabric of life. How else can we see how else can we see that truth is always defined by its opposite number, meaning that to know good implies knowledge of its opposite, bad or evil, or whatever adjective you want to attach to the negative stuff. But allowing suffering as God seems so often to appear to do, doesn't, by extension, mean that God intends for us to suffer. And this is where Lamentations and Luke combine to deliver the same message of hope that is wrapped in steadfast trust. Lamentations tells us that God is always working to bend the arc of suffering towards something better, towards something good. To paraphrase that wonderful old hymn, in fact, I think we sang it just a few weeks ago, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Morning by morning. There's always a new and better day in the kingdom of God, that safe place to be, if, and here's the big kicker, if we look to the light, to the joy, to the promise, and not lament over the mistakes and messes of the past. For God is always, always, in ever steadfast love, yet often mysterious ways, moving us toward that safe harbor that he promises. But to reach that place of trust, we need the faith of the well-known mustard seed, that familiar parable found not only in Luke, but versions also in Matthew and Mark. 
And this is not, by the way, a tale of miracles, but rather wise counsel about accountability and expectation. There are two ways to hold the mustard seed in your imagination. A few verses before this passage that Mike read, when Jesus tries to tell the disciples that forgiveness is a never-ending process, they worry that they don't have enough faith to do that. That's asking more of them than they feel capable of. Increase our faith, Lord. We're not you. Many interpreters see Jesus' response for that plea as scolding his followers, suggesting that they don't have enough faith. For if they did, they can move mountains and even transform lives. Even the Greek syntax, the original language, seems to suggest a reproaching tone from our Savior. You guys just don't get it. And perhaps he was that way. But if you believe, as we do in the United Church of Christ, that God is still speaking today and that his message wasn't trapped in a context that's 2,000 years old, we can flip that paradigm. And in so doing, maybe we can hear Jesus answering the disciples with kindness instead of a reprimand. And maybe even with a bit of a smile. Look, you really don't need more faith. You can almost hear him saying that. Even this much, even this tiny pinch is enough. How often do we hear, even look for the negative tone in our Savior's voice? We listen for the negative, I think, because we wrongly think that faith is all on us. That we have to do something. In this case, though, if we hear Jesus speak with the voice of love rather than demand, we hear him telling the apostles, the apostles that, in fact, they already have enough faith to do what is required of them. It's another way of saying, you really do have this. You really are better than you think you are. But you've got to believe if I've heard it once, I've heard it a dozen times from many of you. Pastor, I just don't know if my faith is strong enough. I know of someone who worried that her prayers weren't anguished enough. I usually respond, you have more faith than you think you do. The problem of how much faith is enough misses the point. It becomes an issue only when we think of faith as ours, something that's part of some 12-step program to heaven that we have to check off and keep marching forward on. It's our to-do list. We tend to think of faith as ours rather than an unmerited gift from God who has hardwired us with the means to know him. He's created the desire that through the faith of the mustard seed, he's also given us the wherewithal to achieve our desire, which is to know God more. When the disciples, knowing the difficult days were coming, asked for more faith, Jesus responds they should take baby steps not looking to themselves and their own fortitude, but looking instead to the one they're following. Faith in this context of the mustard seed is not theirs to be owned, but the work of the Holy Spirit that binds them to Christ. But there's a danger in this mustard seed parable. 
there's danger in taking it too far in the wrong direction. While it only takes a little bit of faith to move a great God into action, this story does not imply that sometimes popular notion of a prosperity gospel or what TV preachers promise, you know, a Mercedes in every garage if you just pray hard enough. Such an interpretation that you can recruit God for any project in your life inevitably means that folks who struggle aren't worthy of God's favor. If God rewards this person over here and doesn't reward this person over here, then what's wrong with so-and-so over here? As is so often the case with biblical parables, Seemingly unrelated images are tied together to create a bigger message. In this case, the mustard seed is sandwiched between the story of Jesus telling the disciples they're called to forgive seven times over and the strange and to our ears uncomfortable and perplexing image of a slave following the orders of a master. When we hear the comparison of worthless slave we have to remember who's telling the story. Jesus is using a first century reality, namely that people often work for years in indentured servitude. He's using this reality to describe the dual-edged nature of the faith he was calling people toward. I am among you as one who serves. Luke has Jesus saying a couple of chapters later, Jesus sought out those whom the rest of the first, first century world regarded as unworthy and called them friends. He did this as a way of demonstrating how all of us are to relate to God, the God who made us, the God who owes us nothing because we are already his to begin with. Just as God, through Jesus, willingly became our debtor, we too are called by that pinch of faith to first learn to kneel and to serve. Whoever shall lose his life, remember that from Matthew, shall find it. This passage in Luke denies all human merits, all human claims on God. But yet these same worthless slaves whom we meet in this passage are the very same who receive God's grace as a gift. A gift that recognizes their extraordinary worth. Our extraordinary worth. To understand faith in this way, not as a possession, not as an accomplishment, not as a mental exercise, but as a way of life. That's what we're called to envision by this little pinch, this image of a mustard seed. Our little bit of faith, all that we need, is about obedience, trusting that God is a safe place to be, no matter what even if that no matter what is uncertain to be uncertainty about a church's future no matter what and if we live that way that god has us that god's as those commercials about the military say god's got our six god's got our back simple trusting obedience putting one foot in front of the other about faith being 90% of faith is simply showing up. We discover more through that lens, that attitude, that willingness than we ever dared to dream about divine blessing. We find that God who expects much from us also promises much in return. That is the message of the mustard seed. That is the message of the parable of the servant 
for the slave. Shalom and Amen.